for this very special program, The Exciting State of Regenerative Medicine by Dr. Sharon Presnell. For those of you that do not know, Rotary District 7690 consists of 49 clubs and 2,529 members located primarily in Piedmont, North Carolina. Our motto is service above self. And if you are interested in being a Rotarian, please contact me or any Rotarian. I would like to ask our current district membership chairperson and past district governor, Charles Allen, to open up our meeting with the invocation. Charles has been a member of the, Rotary, of the Randolph Rotary Club since 1993. Charles? Thank you, Governor Randy, and welcome everyone. Would you bow with me as we pray? And uh, our Father, we come to your presence today to ask you to use our opportunity to hear new innovative events that are going on in the area of regenerative medicine. As we hear about those, that we'll embrace those as Rotarians and look at ways that we can be part of that partnership. Thank you for Dr. Presnell and her work and the, the work that she does there and the, uh, the group that is making this a reality. We ask you to bless them and give them wisdom and insight as they work through these new innovative techniques and all the things that go along with regenerative medicine. We thank you now for the opportunity as Rotarians to gather to hear this information, help us to use it in our world as Rotary that we can make a difference and thank you, Father, for just uh, working in our lives, and we give you thanks. Amen. Charles, thank you for the invocation. And now I would like to introduce past District Governor Mike Conrad, a charter member of the Gate City Rotary Club since 1991. Mike is currently serving as the District 7690 Polio Chair. Starting July 1, he will serve for three years on the Rotary Foundation's Water and Sanitation Major Gifts Initiative. Mike will introduce our guest speaker. Mike. Thanks, Randy, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a real honor for me to recognize uh, our speaker, Dr. Sharon Presnell. Uh, she received her BS degree at NC State University and then her PhD in cell and molecular pathology from the Medical College of Virginia. And after completing her postdoctoral work, uh, she was on the faculty at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill before joining Becton Dickinson to lead a multidisciplinary cell, cell biology discovery and product development team. Since then, she's held many leadership positions. She is a native of North Carolina and actually raised in our district. So we should be very proud that uh, Dr. Presnell was uh, born in Yakin County and she returned home to her home state in 2018 and resides in Winston-Salem with her daughter. She now serves as the president of Amnion Foundation where she is highly committed to ensuring that the high potential cells contained within birth tissue are recovered and made available for the advancement of regenerative medicine and drug discovery. She's on several boards and has been advisors on many boards, one of being uh, at the NC State College of Life Sciences Foundation Board and the University of Virginia Foundation Board. She has published more than 30 papers and holds numerous patents related to sales and their application to regenerative medicine and drug discovery. A little anecdotal information about her is in growing up, her dad enjoyed uh, restoring old cars. And so she was alongside him and was watching what he was doing. So the two of them together decided to restore a 1967 Chevy Chevelle. 
and she drives that today. So without further ado, Dr. Presnell, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, get to know you all and to present what we're doing here at the foundation to you today. And I hope that everybody will feel very comfortable asking any questions that come to mind. Uh, we welcome all of them. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. I've got some slides to kind of help us get through some content and material. Um, and I hope that this will be interesting for you and that you'll learn something along the way. Um, I, um, let's see, here we go, we'll make sure, and then go to slideshow. So is everybody able to see my screen now, the slides? Yes, I can, I okay, think so. Great. Okay, yeah. And everybody can hear me okay. If, if you run into any trouble, just let Mike know and he will stop me uh, and get things squared away. And um, I know that not everyone is going to have had a scientific background. And so I, I do my best to, to make this at a level of explanation that is both interesting um, and accurate. And if at any point in time I'm using words or things that you would like some clarity on, I hope that you'll type in a question or, or ask a question because um, this is really a fascinating area of work. Um, working on the placenta and birth tissue in particular has been relatively new to me and I love to learn new things and this has been quite a journey because it's amazing. It's an amazing organ, an amazing tissue with a lot of potential. Um, and so I, I, I want you to leave today as excited about it as I am. Uh, so uh, with no further, we'll get into some, um, some content here. So um, for today, I thought we could go through a few kind of short stories because we could talk about birth tissue and everything that's going on with that probably for a whole day. Um, but this is meant to be an introduction. And um, I thought I would tell you a little bit about the history and the mission of the foundation. And then we're gonna have a small primer on some of the terminology that we use and, and what it means so that we can get into some science today, which is um, not only easy to understand, but very exciting and interesting because it's going on in our community. Um, we're gonna talk about birth tissue derived cells um, in regenerative medicine, but we're also gonna talk about those cells in pharmaceutical discovery and development because Regenerative medicine and pharmaceutical development is, is um, those lines are getting more and more blurry because now we, we understand that there are a lot of regenerative phenomenon that can be addressed not only with living cells, but also uh, with small molecules that influence those living cells. And so it all becomes part of the same picture. Um, so a little bit of the history of the foundation. So uh, we are a not-for-profit registered 501c3 organization. Um, we were created um, from some generous donations from within our community that were provided uh, to Dr. Anthony Atala, who is the director of the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. And what he decided to do was to use those funds to create this not-for-profit foundation so that we had a um, organization here that was really dedicated to bringing the cells and the um, components of birth tissue that are valuable in regenerative medicine forward, but to be focused on that mission versus the mission of making uh, a profit. So I think that is a, a really uh, one of the things that attracted me to come here and do this at this point in my career. It resonates a lot with how I feel about how these technologies should be managed. There was an original mission in 2012 that was set forward that said, you know, we're going to collect and bank this uh, specific population of very unique stem cells. Um, these came out of some proprietary work that was done by Dr. Atala. Um, actually, even up in Boston before he moved down to North Carolina had started work in this area. And they're isolated from the placenta. And the mission initially was to ensure that these cells were collected and banked and held in the freezer to be used in the future for regenerative medicine therapy. 
And you can think of that along a couple of different lines. You could say, well, parents who are having a baby might decide that they want to bank their own baby cells and keep them for that baby. And as it gets older, if something goes wrong, they'd have those cells to use for that baby. And some people opt to do that. There's another philosophy that says, if there are valuable cells that can be used not only for that baby, but for all babies or all people who have chronic degenerative diseases, that you could make a public bank, a publicly accessible bank of these cells that anyone could use, not just the baby that they came from. And so both of those paths are perfectly legitimate paths. We are geared greatly towards supporting the public bank and making cells widely available for everyone. Um, and there are uh, other entities that focus on private banking, um, really besides us. So in 2019, um, when I came on board, we decided very purposely to expand the mission of the foundation and continue along that avenue of banking the cells, but expand the uses of them so that we were also supporting the very important basic research, preclinical work, and everything that has to happen before those cells are, are put into a therapy in a person, there's a lot of work that has to get done first. And so we wanna make sure we're supporting that full spectrum of work. And so we have expanded our mission to do that. And then we also understand that there are a lot of cells in the placenta and the umbilical cord, not just these placental stem cells that we work with here. And we wanted to make sure that when somebody donates a tissue that we are getting everything out of it that could be used to make life better and provide new cures for people down the road. And so we expanded the cell types that we get out of these tissues as well. So in 2020, you know, our, our world very recently has been transformed uh, by COVID-19. And we have made changes here in how we operate uh, with our staff so that everyone remains safe throughout this time. Uh, but we are functional, operational. We continue to take in donated tissues and process those here. Uh, we've changed our practices so that there's a greater degree of attention on the safety side of things. Um, but that was already pretty high because any anytime you're dealing with human materials on a regular basis, you have to handle the possibility of potential infectious diseases. And so we're very well versed in that here. So we have not stopped working. Uh, we are very much still on our mission. And now more than ever, and we're gonna talk about some of the reasons why that I hope you get excited as we go along, having a safe and reliable and ethically sourced um, resource for human cells, we need that now more than ever to support new therapies, including things that help us deal with aggressive infectious diseases. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more towards the end. So a word or two about Dr. Atala. So he is our founding board member and he, he is an advisor for us, <laughs> excuse me, and provides us with a lot of, of wisdom uh, you know, as we go on our journey. He's the head of the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. He is a world leader in the discovery and development of innovative approaches in regenerative medicine. There are 15 technologies that have been developed in his laboratory that have been used in patients. And um, that might not sound like a big number, but it actually is a huge number. Um, for one laboratory to bring that many things forward is, is very, very impressive. Um, he also has over 600 publications and over 250 national and international patents in this space. And so we're very fortunate not only to have him advising the foundation, but to have the Wake Forest Institute and Dr. Atala as part of our regional local community. It is a, is a very fortunate thing. So I talked a little bit about how we've uh, broadened our, our mission. Um, so today our mission, as if you go to our website, you'll see the same language, is to ensure that the valuable living cells that are found within birth tissues are made broadly accessible to support this groundbreaking research and the development of life-changing therapies. Um, that accessibility part is a, is a big part of my personal mission and a big part of why I'm excited about what we do is 
you know, there, there's lots of uh, sayings about what happens to things that you keep isolated and don't, don't share and don't put out there where uh, lots and lots of smart people can use it. Because I think that's how the really uh, innovative things come forward is when you let go of them and put them out into the community. And so this is a big deal um, to kind of make that, make that transition. So we, uh, when we get a tissue in the door, our goal is to bank the human placental stem cells that uh, are gonna support this research, especially in regenerative medicine. And this is uh, a very important cell type and we'll get into some of the details about why, what makes it so interesting. We're also gonna make the most of every one of these donated tissues. You know, my personal goal is, you know, the placenta is a very large organ and I'm not just, you know, so you don't worry, I'm not gonna show you an actual picture of one today. It can be a little bloody and disturbing. And so I decided not to do that to you since it's the lunch hour. Um, but our goal is to make the most of every one of these tissues so that when we are done processing this organ, there's very little that we're actually gonna discard we're going to capture as much as we can because it is chock full of healthy living cells that can be used for so many good things. We don't want that to get discarded. You can also think of the Amnion Foundation as well. We don't have our sights on one particular application and one particular thing that we're trying to do and, and um, you know we're doing that inside. You can think of us as a very trusted partner for lots of labs and lots of organizations that are bringing these things forward. Um, for example, Wake Forest Institute, um, other academic institutes, pharmaceutical companies that are developing uh, technologies for which they need cells to answer questions. And so there's this uh, old ad that used to go uh, around for BASF is, you know, we don't make the products that you make, we make them better or, you know, the Intel inside your computer. And I think you can think of the cells that we make at the Amnion Foundation as being that, you know, our goal is to be the utmost high integrity and quality of the raw materials that go into these therapies that are really going to change the way that, um, that patients experience medicine. So uh, a little bit of a birth tissue primer. So the, the placenta is the only organ that we, we as humans have that forms anew after birth. And so uh, during pregnancy, uh, when the embryo, the blastocyst it's called at that stage, makes contact with the, the wall of the uterus, fetal cells and maternal cells kind of come together and they make this organ together. And so you end up with this uh, kind of a thick sac with a cord that attaches to the baby. And that's a picture of it um, here is the, the placenta and the umbilical cord that attaches to the baby. And if you were to look over here, this is a higher power uh, kind of drawing of the same thing. The cells that make up this cord and make up this tissue are the same genetically. They came from the baby. And on this side of the placenta, on the right side, uh, the, what's called the decidual side, those are the cells that came from the mother. And so, you know, we want to always be sure that people understand the cells that we work with are coming from the discarded birth tissue that is around the baby. At no time do we touch the baby or, or uh, take any cells out of the baby. It's just that the sac that surrounds the baby happens to have been made from some of the baby cells, and that's how um, that's how it it works biologically. And we can take advantage of that um, and have cells that are of uh, what you would say fetal origin. They originated in the baby, but they are part of the afterbirth that is discarded, and they're not collected or touched until after the birth process is over, and the placenta is in a bucket. And uh, rather than throwing it away, we're gonna take it and isolate these cells. And you can certainly s isolate the cells from the maternal side as well. And so, you know, while the baby is in the sac, it is providing blood flow. It's a very vascularized organ. It provides gas exchange, it eliminates waste. It even has endocrine functions where it makes hormones that control certain things during the, during the pregnancy and birth and it provides some physical protection for that developing fetus. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing, uh, like I said, I, I really didn't know so much about it when I came here and I still, you know, what I know would fit in a thimble and I have a lot to learn. 
um, but it is an amazing organ that the human body can create this thing in this partnership between the developing child and the mother. So the, the placenta in a lot of cases is just discarded after the baby is born. And I think this is an unfortunate thing, but it does happen a lot because the placenta and the cord contain many, many, many living cells. The, certainly the stem cells that we are very interested in here, uh, those originate from the fetal side of the placenta. Um, and then there are other cells that come from the umbilical cord and from the maternal side. And we're going to talk about these different cell types. There's no need to kind of sweat all the ones that, that are listed here. But the point is it's a very, very rich source of cells. And it provides some important advantages over trying to source those cells from other types of tissue. So the, the bottom line is that you can make this one donation. So, you know, if you're not going to bank cells for your own baby and you've got this placenta, uh, you can make this one donation of a tissue and it's going to have so many opportunities to make an impact. It's almost, uh, you know, too many to count if you uh, stretch it down the road of all the different places those cells can go. So I thought it would be good to talk a little bit about terminology. So um, the placental stem cells, as I mentioned before, originate from the baby portion of the placenta and they're isolated after the birth. And that's an important distinction. I want everybody to be very clear that in this case, nobody is going in and doing anything um, to the baby or mother. This is just simply tissue that otherwise might have been considered as waste. These cells have a high degree of what we call plasticity. And that means that they have the capability of becoming lots of other cell types in the body. And that's exciting because you hear about that for what people call stem cells that are of embryonic origin. Um, and those have a lot more ethical concerns around them. These do not, but they still retain a lot of that plasticity. And that's an exciting thing for us to think about as, as biologists and developers of what we can do with that resource. So I mentioned before that the placenta is a very vascularized. There's lots of blood vessels in the placenta, and that means that cells like endothelial cells, which are the cells that line the surface of the blood vessels, and they create a barrier between the circulating blood and the underlying tissue. Those cells are plentiful in a birth tissue, and these are a cell type that are widely used in regenerative medicine and pharmaceutical discovery. Um, there are also macrophages, and macrophages are cells of our immune system that kind of live in our tissues. They hang out actually in our tissues all through our body. And their job is to gobble up microorganisms and dead cells and debris and kind of they're the cleanup crew, um, which is also called phagocytose, which is how they get their name. There's a lot of Latin and Greek origins in these uh, names. They also orchestrate the activity of a lot of other cells in the immune system. So when you hear terms like cytokine storms and uh, you know, acute inflammation, um, a lot of times macrophages and T cells are communicating with each other um, and they, those are orchestrating these events. Mesenchymal stem or stromal cells are progenitor cells. They don't have quite the same level of plasticity as the placental stem cells that we talked about in that first bullet point, but they're also of mesodermal origin and they can become multiple what we call mesenchymal cell types. And so that's a little more limited, but definitely includes things like bone, muscle, cartilage, and fat. And then uh, down at the bottom there is another cell type to mention, trophoblasts. So these are highly specialized cells that, that line the chorion, and along, which is the fetal side, and along with endothelial cells, create the barrier between the maternal and fetal circulation. So that's something that's also really important in drug safety and looking at uh, whether something has a toxic effect or not is understanding whether it can cross that maternal fetal barrier. And so, you know, in this rich tissue that we have, we have all these solutions to make systems that enable those questions to be answered. And then uh, later in the presentation, we're gonna talk a little bit about some data. And so understanding the difference between primary cells and cell lines. So primary cells are cells that we have basically just recently removed them from the body. And they're either used immediately or they're placed in culture for a very short period of time to run assays and, or to go into regenerative medicine products. Whereas a cell line, 
which a lot of times, if you've heard of HeLa cells, that's a very uh, well-recognized one has some, some controversy around it. So these cell lines are isolated usually a long time ago. They've been cultured extensively in and out of the freezer a bunch of times. They've gone through lots of population doublings. And they're, they're used over and over and over. And people love them because they're very reproducible. If you're a scientist and you want to get the data and you want to kind of know how the experiment's going to turn out before you do it, you can use a cell line and it's very predictable. But unfortunately, it's not very accurate. It doesn't do a great job of predicting human outcomes because it's just too far removed from that human body. Um, and often the cell lines that are out there that people can go get and use for drug discovery in particular, they have been discarded from a tumor tissue, not a normal tissue. And so if you're studying that cancer, that might be good. Um, but if you're not, and you're trying to determine whether a drug's gonna be safe going into people, you probably don't wanna use a tumor derived cell. And so that's our kind of primer, and you can come back and refer to those uh, as we go through the rest of the presentation. So a little bit about our basic operational structure here. Um, so the, the birth parents, that are having the baby. So they make the decision they don't wanna keep their placenta. So then they always have the first choice of, well, am I gonna keep it and do something with it? And people do lots of interesting things with it. I'm not gonna get into that to you today, but you, I encourage you to Google it. You'll learn some fascinating things. Some of them are a little disturbing. Um, and then uh, instead of throwing it away or banking it for themselves, which some people will do, they choose to donate it. And so when they make that decision, there's a flurry of things that happen. So first of all, legally, you know, we have to make sure that everything is done right. Um, and we have a partner for that, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, um, that they complete forms, uh, you know, medical history, they consent to have serology testing to make sure that mom doesn't have some infectious diseases that we would need to know about if we were gonna handle that tissue. And then we have to make sure that they understand fully that the tissue that they're gonna donate is gonna be turned into cells and those cells are gonna be used and they're not gonna get paid for that. And we have to make sure that that is very, very clear and that everybody's on the same page and we're compliant with any of our local, state and federal laws. And that's, that is an incredibly important part of the process. And that's why we have this great partnership uh, with a, a uh, organization here locally also in Winston-Salem called Birth Tissue Recovery, and they do a outstanding job of managing that relationship with the donor and understanding the consent and making sure that when we take something in here, that every I is dotted and every T is crossed and to the utmost potential, every ethical thing has been addressed before the tissue comes in the door to be used. And this is a really important part. Of, of a process and the understanding of it. So once the tissue comes in the door, we work very quickly. It's a flurry of activity. If you come here uh, during one of those days, you will see every single one of us gowned up and in the lab doing our part of the job um, because we are working furiously to make sure that all the cells that matter are getting into the freezer, into culture, or, you know, into the hands of our uh, partners who need them to do experiments. And so each of the lot of cells that we make, we do a, an extensive amount of characterization of those to make sure that they are safe, we understand them, and uh, that the quality of them is very, very good. And uh, I thought I would just share with you, so this announcement just went out uh, last week. So we uh, formally announced our partnership with Birth Tissue Recovery last week. And it's really unique because what this does is it enables between birth tissue recovery and us, we have complete transparency and complete control over every step of the process from that conversation with the birth parents that are deciding that they're gonna donate their tissue until the point that what we are going to provide and put in someone's hands goes into the freezer, into the vial that they're, you're gonna hand them. And that is remarkable, and that's we're so lucky to have an organization like that locally. And I think they feel the same way about us because th there's a lot of synergy there. And it's very exciting to have that resource locally, just like I talk about WFIRM for application development. Having these guys on the front end makes a, a huge difference for us. So when we characterize these cells, what I mean by that, um, so we're, we're taking the serum chemistry data from the donor, mom, 
and making sure that we're not dealing with any kind of infectious agents that we need to know about. And so we're testing for everything that can be tested for um, at, a, at a CLIA certified testing lab. So we take that part extremely seriously. We will also test the cells again at the end of the isolation and we'll make sure that they do not have any uh, adventitious agents, meaning they come from other species or that they uh, are sterile. Uh, and free of any kind of bacteria or virus contamination that we would be worried about. We also profile the cells in the end, and this is an important um, uh, thing for us to do. We look at the growth rate of the cells, uh, how big they are, the size of them, the morphology, make sure all of that is as it should be. We will examine the proteins that the cells make, and that kind of tells you what cell type it is. It's like a fingerprint for a cell type. And we do that uh, multiple times with every lot of cells to make sure that when we believe it's an endothelial cell or a placental stem cell that we have checked and checked again and checked a third time and made sure that what we believe we have is what we have. We do something also very unique is we analyze the chromosomes and we make sure that the processes that we have uh, put the cells through to isolate them and get them into the freezer have not damaged the cells in any way. A cool little aside, I actually, Anna sent me this data yesterday. It's very fresh. So if she's, uh, she gets to see this, she's going to go, hey, you took my data today. Um, but we do karyotyping of the lots that we make here of cells. And um, because the, this particular one, the baby was a male, and remember when I said that the, we work with the placental stem cells that are um, from the fetal side of the placenta, we see that little Y chromosome, which is here, right there. Um, and that gives us, and they also tell you in the results, this is also done in an outside certified testing lab. This lets you know that yes, you did exactly what you thought you did, that the cells that you isolated, the stem cells that you got actually were uh, originating in the, the baby, not the mom. And it also, if you look at the bottom, this is from the uh, testing lab. This is a normal karyotype, no abnormalities were detected. And so this is an important part of the QC for us. If I, if I were gonna have cells put into my body, I would wanna know that this test was done. Um, and so the other thing we do, so at the bottom here, these are endothelial cells in culture, and we've stimulated them a certain way and what they should do if they are, if they are vascular cells, they should make blood vessels, and that's indeed what they're doing. And so we're looking at things to say, okay, the cells, they, they look like um, the cells that we wanted. They, they phenotype, meaning their pro protein profile is like what we wanted, and now they're actually doing what they're supposed to do. They're making these vessels. So we're checking every way we can possible, possibly check to make sure the quality is there. And that's really important as we get into, you know, kind of part three and four of our stories today. So I'm gonna talk now just a bit about using birth tissue derived cells in drug discovery and development. This is a little, uh, might be an unexpected topic because we all think about regenerative medicine and we think about that as, you know, I'm gonna take this, this, old liver out that's not working very well, I'm gonna make a whole new one and plug that in. And I think the field is transitioning and, and has been for some time to understand that, you know, what we put in to, to replace a function may not look like what came out. It's okay if it's different. And sometimes there are things that we can do to stimulate the body's own regenerative process uh, versus having to make something completely de novo and put it in. And that's a lovely way to go about it because then it's probably a faster path for the patient, more integrated outcomes for the patient um, and, and, and better all around. So the drug discovery process itself, you know, you may screen, say you're looking for treatments for type two diabetes, um, some of the complications from type two diabetes. So you may, you may screen the genomics of 50 patients and you see what you think are some targets in there, some pathways that are unique to those patients that are not in the normal uh, cohort, normal controls. And so then you would go and validate that target. You'd say, well, okay, I'm gonna take some cells from a diabetic patient, or I'm gonna take some tissue and I'm actually gonna ice and I'm gonna look now and see if are they really different. You're gonna validate that target. 
you're going to develop assays that enable you to examine that target plus or minus drugs that might interfere with that target. And a drug could be a small molecule, it could be an antibody, it could be a cell. Um, but you need those assays to be able to tell you um, that whether you're on track or off track, or if you're comparing five things, which one works best. And so those assay, that assay part, and even the validation part, cannot be done without the use of living cells in a culture dish and putting the drugs on the cells. And so that's a really important part of uh, the drug discovery process. Um, and then as you, as you identify compounds or molecules or cells even out of that discovery phase, you're going to keep going back and doing that over and over again and optimize. And you might go back to the chemist if it's a small molecule and say, hey, you know, this is looking good, but we, we need, um, you know, more stability or we need, and they can modify that and come back to you with additional compounds to try. So throughout this entire process, cells are needed and, and the answers that you get with the cells really, really matter. If you ask a really great question, but you ask it of the wrong cell, you know, maybe you've wasted your time and the pharm pharma company's money. Then once you have that candidate, there's a whole slew of other tests that have to be done that involve cells, also involves some animals, but, uh, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and that's really to say, I have this lead compound and I am getting ready to put it in some human beings, but first I need to test it to make sure it's not gonna hurt them. And so that's the safety part of the equation and cells come into play again there in spades and there it's where really the human cell being part of the equation is very important. So there's this quote that uh, I love um, from Albert Einstein, and it says, not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And this is so true. As scientists, we love data, and we love it when our data is reproducible and we can make it, and our standard errors are very, very tiny, and we love that. Uh, you know, but we're not like that. Human beings are not like that. We are all, uh, you know, uh, outbred, if you will. Uh, and whereas a lot of the animal models are highly, heavily inbred uh, strains of rats and, and people choose them because they know they're going to get the answer they want, not because they're really um, uh, going to ask the, I don't even know how the answer is going to be, but give it to me uh, questions. So there's a couple of things to think about um, in this space. So one is physiologic relevance. So the data that are obtained from animal studies so you say, well, I need to really check this, that, or the other. So they dose rats or mice with the drug before they put it into humans. Unfortunately, that data often does not translate to the human outcomes. There's just too many species differences. And it, it really uh, is a problem there. And then um, there is a lot of controversy, really, and rightly so, about the use of animals in basic research and preclinical testing. And there is a mandate for us all that, that do work in this space to reduce, replace, and refine the three R's, um, laboratory animal usage in this space. And we really want to make more use of human cells. And, and A, because it's more physiologically relevant because it's human, and B, because it keeps us from using these animals unnecessarily. And that should be part of our mission. And in Europe, there's a even more strict standards now on what can be done um, with animals. And so we really should be moving towards not using them and building human systems that enable us to, um, to answer the questions that we need to answer that way. So animals are poor predictors of human outcomes, and we don't really need additional proof of that, but I love this figure that's on the right here. And you know, what I'll, what I'll explain is, um, hopefully you can see my little clicker. Um, so this is correlation data. So the higher the number, the more correlated something is, and the lower the number, the, the less correlated it is. And so they took a bunch of studies that have been done in, in mice and humans, and the only place they really saw a correlation was say, the things that changed in human burn versus human trauma, or human endotoxemia versus human burn. So the human diseases had some degree of correlation. The, the trauma and burns, pretty, pretty good. 
But now if you go across and you say, what about mouse trauma and human trauma? 0.05. So the, the correlation between mice and humans um, is very poor. But then even the really shocking thing is if you come down to the right corner and you look at the correlation between mouse and mouse, also extremely poor. So not only do the animal models not agree with human outcomes, the animal models don't agree with the animal outcomes, with their own outcomes. And so that should be giving us a big sign that we should stop that. And uh, if we need examples, there are plenty. So uh, corticosteroids, which we use uh, in medicine and human beings all over the place, thank goodness, uh, organ transplant patients, uh, anti-rejection uh, for those of us who have, uh, you know, itchy rashes in the summer and we want to put some steroids on our uh, rashes and get rid of them. So these are teratogens in animals. They cause malformation of embryos. And if you went on the animal data only, you wouldn't give them to human beings. Um, and then the opposite of that is thalidomide. Great example. Everybody knows the history of that. Um, it is not a teratogen in animals. And so it was passed on uh, and put into to, uh, use in human beings, but caused significant birth defects. And there's, that's two uh, small examples, but there are lots. But I thought I would share with you guys a case study that, that I found very impactful because these were healthy volunteers that, that volunteered for a study. So TGN 1412 was an immunomodulatory monoclonal antibody. And what it was designed to do is basically just rebalance the immune system, hit the reset button in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, leukemia, and MS by interacting with this protein on the cell surface called CD28. And preclinical studies were done in uh, human cell lines and in multiple animal species, including primates, which is you know, considered to be the ultimate translation to humans. And in those studies, they were all safe and efficacious and everything was great. So a first in man phase one trial was initiated and uh, six healthy volunteers received a single dose of this uh, molecule, of this antibody. And all of them uh, proceeded to have a very, very severe cytokine storm. There was severe lung, cardiovascular, and kidney injury. Several of them were on heart-lung machines for weeks. Um, nobody died, but they, their lives were impacted, and some of them still uh, have the uh, sequela of that, the outcome of that uh, they still carry. And subsequently, it was determined that, so the, the target T cells of the immune system in this particular type of primate that was used in the study actually did not have the CD28 um, on the surface of the cell. And that was something that was a, a discoverable fact before the study started, but it wasn't discovered. And so that species was unable to interact with the drug as intended. So the drug was given and nothing happened so, because the target was not there. So the ability to detect a safety problem was, was really just not there. Then subsequently, they took primary, not cell lines like they had used in the previous, but they took primary human cells and were able to just do a very simple experiment, taking that antibody, putting it on those primary cells in a controlled assay and cytokine storm. So the primary human cells would have predicted this. And if you look, the graph on the right is the, these patients after infusion of the antibody. C-reactive protein is a protein you can measure in the blood, bloodstream that just tells you, whoa, there is a massive cytokine storm going on, massive inflammation. And so you see how high those levels got in those patients um, within those days after infusion. And, and the, the damage was significant and not easily resolved. And so that's a very serious um, case and example. And the takeaway message is really, for me, any new biologically active molecule that's gonna be used in humans needs to be tested very thoroughly in a human model system before it is given to human beings. And uh, there is no, no substitute for that really, in my opinion. So changing gears a little bit, um, we'll talk about birth tissue derived cells in regenerative medicine. And this is now, um, you know, certainly you can think of small molecules and antibodies and all those things of being in the regenerative medicine space, but by and large, people are still 
thinking of it in terms of delivering living cells or cells combined with biomaterials, proteins derived from the living cells, um, and now even small molecules um, to regrow, repair, or replace damaged or diseased cells, organs, or tissues. So some examples of this would be, so you're gonna make a, a completely new tissue from scratch, and it's gonna probably have living cells in it, and you're gonna remove something in the body that's damaged or diseased and replace it with this, and it's a, a kind of a one-to-one -one replacement. A vascular graft would be a good example of that. So let's say you have a blocked, um, uh, a blocked blood vessel, and now that one is gonna be excised, and you're gonna put this tissue engineered vessel in its place uh, so that blood can flow again to that part of the body. Now, this is, uh, these are things that are already being done in the clinic uh, and, and very advanced um, technology, which is exciting. Um, so you may think of it in terms of delivering a component of an organ that is missing. So not the whole tissue is kind of okay, like your pancreas might be fine, but the pancreatic islets that make the insulin in your pancreas are not fine and the islet part needs to be replaced. And so pancreatic islet replacement is also something that has already been done in the clinic and is um, an area of continuous innovation and effort to try to replace that function for, especially for type one diabetics. And then you can think of delivery of products that where you're not necessarily putting the living cells in, but you're making something, or you may be putting cells in, but they're designed to, to be there to do a different type of job rather than say, replacing your pancreatic islets. Their job might be to um, kind of push the reset button on the immune system and stop a cytokine storm, or it might be to, um, it might be to stimulate regeneration in the islets that are already there, say early in the stage of diabetes. So there's multiple different ways of intervening in chronic diseases with regenerative medicine strategies. So why in the world would you focus on birth tissues for regenerative medicine? Well, I think this is a, a place where it's a very it, kind of easy to see the benefits. So birth tissue is extremely safe, it's reliable, it's a plentiful resource from which lots of regenerative cells can be obtained. Um, your other options are using uh, embryonic or IPS-derived stem cells, and those can pose some technical challenges for sure, and also for many people, ethical concerns as well. Um, cadaveric tissue, meaning somebody has died and donated their organs, and some things are used for transplant, but not everything is used for transplant. You can certainly isolate cells in those situations, and many people do, but you are dealing usually with a sick, um, somebody has to pass away for that to happen. It's, it's, so it's a, it's a little more, um, uh, it's not as happy of a source of tissue, if you will, as the birth tissue. So somebody's got to pass away. They usually have chronic uh, disease or significant trauma. There's a, often a long delay between the time that you uh, could potentially get that tissue and you actually get it. And then you're gonna have whatever that individual had experienced all of the accumulated genetic damage over the life of that individual, um, anything that happened during the trauma leading to the death of that individual. And so there's a lot of things that come along with using adult cells that came from cadaveric tissue that you don't have to worry about when you're using birth tissue. It's an it's a incredibly unique situation where you've got this very healthy tissue and how many babies are born every day. And it's just, it's there and it's plentiful and it's not controversial because the cells are isolated and taken from that tissue after the birth process is complete. Um, there's really no risk to the baby. There's no risk to the mom. And there, there, you don't have the ethical dilemmas that you have with some of the other stem cell choices. Um, <clears throat> we see enhanced plasticity in the cells um, that come from birth tissue compared to adult tissue. And these cells can be directed in the lab to turn into multiple specialized cell types. And it may, be, it may be more of an advantage, for example, to make new muscle cells or new bone cells or new islet cells from a stem cell versus trying to collect them from a, a deceased donor 
that you're now going to take that organ um, and try to make those cells and preserve them. So starting from scratch with a stem cell can offer some advantages that way. And then um, if you've ever heard the word telomere, so the, the uh, telomeres on the chromosomes in the birth tissue are very long, uh, meaning they can withstand a lot of genetic insult before they start um, causing problems with the cells. Uh, so the cells are very youthful, they grow faster, they have a longer lifespan, and they have less accumulated genetic damage. They can withstand a lot more insult than an adult-derived cell can. And so how are these cells being used in regenerative medicine today? So um, if you think about the placenta and cord, there's all kinds of things that are used today. Uh, amniotic and chorionic membranes are used in wound healing, and these are products that are on the market today and go out every day and are used in patients for surgical repairs, um, for wound healing applications. Um, tissue fragments are actually being used today in some applications, cord blood cells, the placental stem cells that we talked about earlier. You can take the cells themselves and make extracts or take the blood and make extracts or make tissue and make extracts, and those have what we call exosomes or microvesicles in them. And those have regulators that if you put them into the body can be immunomodulators or can cause a regenerative response without putting the cells in. And so there's a broad spectrum of opportunity related to these birth tissues. Um, so the, as immunomodulators, there is a lot of work going on today in acute, acute inflammatory diseases, also chronic and autoimmune disorders. And then we see a lot of work as well as seeing these cells or components of the placenta be used as components of engineered tissues that are designed to augment or replace the damaged organs. And so you might see biomaterial like a hydrogel made from birth tissue being used. You might see living cells being used or exosomes being used. And I think the uh, current clinical trial count is about 220, but I popped some up just so that you could look. This is from clinicaltrials.gov, and you can go do your own search and, and explore in there a little bit. Um, but all over the world, um, in the United States and other countries as well, lots of clinical trials going on, taking birth tissue-derived cells and components and testing them for different things. Um, here I just highlighted a few uh, diabetic, diabetic nephropathy, uh, maybe of, of interest, uh, lots of uh, cardiovascular diseases, ischemic diseases, immunomodulatory uh, type applications. So there's a lot of effort in this space advancing these, these uh, products. And I thought it would be nice just to show you a little bit of data. Um, so on the left here is results from a phase one clinical trial with rheumatoid arthritis. And you know, we talked about the inflammation and the cytokine storms, and, and basically what you're able to appreciate here, I think, is this is before and this is after. This is before and this is after. And these are just different cytokine levels in these patients uh, before and after treatment with the cells. And so there's no real question. These are all significantly different. There's no real question whether or not um, there's a benefit here from delivering this, um, this treatment. On the right-hand side is a Crohn's disease. So Crohn's is an autoimmune disease that affects the intestine. It's very painful. It's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to live with every day. And this is a phase one, two trial. It actually had some control arms and uh, randomization, which is great to see. And this is a score just looking at the, they do an endoscopy and put a camera down into the intestine so you can see. And this is the physician's blinded scores of the surface of the intestine and what it looked like. And there's an algorithm that they use to create the data. And with the cells on board, there was a significant improvement in these patients, even 12 months after the treatment. Now, if anyone is a little bit squeamish, please avert your eyes or minimize your screen. I'm going to show you a picture. Uh, for most of us, this won't bother you, but it's so black and white, I thought you should see, because you could imagine what it would be like living with the intestine on the left and living with the intestine on the right. So I'm going to put this picture up now, so just fair warning. So these are two patients. On the left is the inner surface of the intestine before it was treated, and on the right is after, is 12 months after. And the, the nodules and the scarring and the inflammation are clearly obvious on the left and clearly gone on the right. 
So this is a life-changing thing um, for people who have this disease. So now I'm, I've changed it. If anybody's squeamish and looked away, you can look back now. Um, so we're also looking at, at applications that are in the clinic um, for stimulation of regeneration. And so here on the left, we're looking at improved muscle function after a, a trauma. So a, basically a, a hip a surgery and intramuscular delivery of the birth tissue derived stem cells to improve the uh, regrowth of the muscle after that trauma. And a significant increase in the amount of muscle uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in these patients after delivery of even a relatively small dose. And on the right hand side, if, uh, if we look down here, this is the growth of new cartilage um, after implantation of a composite. So this is more of the classic regenerative medicine product where you have a hydrogel and stem cells and that is put in to create new cartilage where there was very little cartilage before. So this is very exciting and there's other areas uh, where people are working. Uh, chronic autoimmune disorders, um, stimulation of nerve regrowth and spinal cord injury and trauma, uh, wounded warriors with um, missing muscle and bone, enhancing outcomes in breast reconstruction after mastectomy. So lots of advancement there in using birth tissue derived materials to make that whole process have a better outcome for that patient. Treatment of urinary incontinence, um, complications of diabetes, in particular wound healing, ulcers, nephropathy you saw in the clinical trial um, portfolio there, and treatment of acute infectious diseases. Now this last one is very interesting in the time that we're living. So something I can't say that, that I have seen in my lifetime. Last week, another announcement um, besides the Amnion BTR partnership, and uh, this is of a completely different magnitude. In, in a, what I would consider record time, uh, the FDA has approved the study um, of these birth tissue derived cells in the treatment of uh, the cytokine storm that is occurring in many of the patients with COVID-19. So this is based on some early preliminary data that looked extremely promising and uh, some historic data where these cells have been delivered for other inflammatory lung diseases and were certainly safe. Um, so it's not that there wasn't precedent data, but this is light speed here um, that these are, are coming forward. And so, you know, with that in mind, I'll just say, you know, go back to the mission. Um, you know, we want these materials to be broadly accessible and we want there to be enough of them to ultimately treat all the people who can be impacted by them. Um, and we want to support all the research and development that has to take place in order for those clinical therapies to become a reality. Um, and so that is what we're doing here. And I am looking forward to having questions from you guys. And, and thank you so much again for, for having me join you and have the opportunity to talk to you today about what we do. Okay, uh, oops, where did my questions go? Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Okay. Well, I had a, more than that before. <laughs> I'll have to find them. Okay, one of them is, uh, is the bladder another example? As I recall, Dr. Talla was printing these on a template several years ago. So uh, the bladder, as a, so I used to work for the company that did the bladder uh, with Dr. Atala's uh, technology, so I'm relatively familiar with it. So in that case, that was an autologous product and it involved taking cells from the actual patient, making that bladder and putting it back. And so those were not birth tissue derived cells, excuse me, for that bladder. But there is some work going on for urinary incontinence, so the bladder sphincter um, that is involving the uh, placental stem cells specifically. And I would also say um, the placental stem cells can be transitioned over into like a smooth muscle cell, which forms the wall of the bladder. And so if, if one were to ever move away from the idea of an autologous product there, meaning you're only using cells that come to yourself, come from yourself and putting them back in yourself. If you were moving on to allogeneic strategies, meaning 
you could accept some immune suppression in order to give the product to someone. You could use cells that came from someone else. Now the uh, birth tissue derived cells would become a very important part of that equation. And they do have some immune privilege, um, especially in their naive state. So there could be some advantages to working with cells like that. Okay, and another one is, could you describe what a randomized double blind study means? I'll do my best, I'll do my best. Um, so the, the randomized means, the, that part of it is the, the patients are gonna come in and they're going to be randomized into receiving placebo or receiving the actual treatment. So in the trial that we were looking at there, they would have received um, like a, a null injection. So it would have been the, the fluid that the cells were suspended in, but not the cells weren't there. And the patient nor the treater knows, the patient nor the physician managing the trial knows, that's the double blind part is you, the, the data stays blinded. It is only unblinded when everything is over so that you don't introduce bias into your interpretation of what you're seeing in the study. Okay. All right, another question. Uh, are the placenta cells from routine deliveries or from abortions and are they, are you buying them from organizations such as Planned Parenthood? Okay, so that's a great question. So we, we do not do anything with any tissue prior to a normal healthy birth. And so we would, uh, and, and that's gonna be true of most people that work in this space. We do not work with aborted tissues. We don't work, we don't purchase anything. Um, we only work with tissue that is donated that was, you know, it was six inches from the trash can. The baby's born, there's a placenta and afterbirth and they've decided not to bank it. They're not gonna take it home and plant a tree over it, which some people do. They're gonna throw it in the trash can and somebody asks them, hey, if you're not gonna use that, would you be willing to donate it um, to support research and, and the development of clinical? And they say, hey, yeah, sure, we'll do that. And they fill out the paperwork and then, then the tissue comes. Mm -hmm. So for us, it, it would only ever be after a healthy birth with full consent um, a full-term baby uh, donated by the parents. Okay. All right. Another question. As a healthcare professional, how can nurses and other practitioners become involved in the cutting edge of STEM therapy and research? Oh, so that's a, that's a great question. And I, I guess it would depend to some degree in what environment um, that you work, um, that you find yourself on a day-to-day -day basis. I think sometimes there are small things, just like being familiar with what's going on out there and being a voice of advocacy for those things, a voice of reason. You know, one of the questions that we get sometimes, uh, or one of the comments that the coordinators that work with the, the um, mothers who are donating their tissues, they almost always get the question, now you're not gonna go clone my baby, are you? And you know, we couldn't do that here, nor would we ever choose to do that here. But that's because of the lay press and the way that they handle certain things. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around stem cells and birth tissues and what people might do with them. And so any opportunity you have to provide uh, sage education is wonderful for all of us. Um, you know, being able to advocate for tissue donation within your network and within your community is another wonderful thing that can be done. Um, you know, we, we love, we have a, a, we have a website or, or a info at uh, amnionfoundation.org. We have an email address to that. And we get sometimes wonderful ideas from people in the community who have read or seen something and they really want to understand um, and contribute their ideas that way and we welcome that as well um, and then there's always the opportunity with within the employment of certain organizations to get involved in clinical trials and get involved um, in the research around uh, bringing these things forward okay have one that says when 
When will IV stem cell therapy be legal and available in North Carolina? Hmm. So that, that's a great question. And I, um, I think there are some things, so that's a big category to say IV stem cell therapy is a really big category. Um, I don't know if you guys uh, follow these things and some of you may um, follow them, but there, there have been places where people um, who have access to human cells or derivatives of human cells, excuse me, have taken some pretty broad liberties in how those are provided to people and also the claims that they make around them. And that has caused some concern, I think, in the field in general. And so I would say, you know, within the, um, within the controlled and regulated medical environment, there are already situations where you can get them. Um, there are trials and um, certainly at Duke, there are some trials for uh, inflammatory diseases and things like that that are going on uh, in the state of North Carolina. And I think there's also some at, going on at UNC Chapel Hill and certainly at Wake Forest. So in the clinical trial setting, yes, you know, the clinics where um, most of those are ex-US today are outside of the United States where you go and get infusions of stem cells for um, different applications like uh, longevity and things like that, that may be a pretty far way away from getting in, into North Carolina. Because I think the bottom line should always be that the right studies have been done uh, through the, through the uh, FDA in the United States to make sure that whatever is getting done is safe and is uh, efficacious. And so we, when those um, criteria are met, I think that they will be available everywhere, including North Carolina. Okay. All right. I have one that says, how accessible would, will these cells be to the public and the cost of the therapies? And would it replace uh, operation or organs for repair or the organ only? Okay, so let's break that up because there's a couple of questions there. Um, How accessible would these uh, be in the future and the, and the cost of the therapies? Yeah, so the accessibility we talked about a little bit. I think, you know, the first place you're going to see access to these is going to be in the major medical centers and clinical trial setting. And then you may see access to them in the outpatient clinic. Um, but probably with an affiliation to a major medical center. And then the third round might be that you see them out in outpatient clinics without that affiliation with a major medical center. Um, the cost of them, um, I would say, is probably going to be on par with some of the other, um, I'm trying to think of the examples. So let's take, uh, you're a transplant patient and you, you have an organ that you're carrying around that belongs to somebody else. And so every month uh, you have to take a slew of drugs and they cost X. You know, the cells are probably less than that uh, or on par with that. And it's gonna depend on the particular application, how many are required for that application um, and what kind of tests had to be done to release them for that application. So there's a lot that, go in, lot that goes into setting pricing. So that, uh, and, and insurance, I will say, I noticed with our insurance company last year, uh, they now list uh, cell therapies as covered, um, covered processes in their specific uh, changes for this past year, they were listed. So I, I thought that was a great thing to see. I actually sent that around to the rest of my employees. Um, yeah. And then and there was the second part. Yeah, would it replace, uh, I guess, a, a surgery or organs for repair or the organ only. I, I okay. assume that means that, you know, that you retain your, is it a repair to a current organ or, uh, hmm. or I think I, yeah, I think I understand. So <laughs> I think the first things that you're going to see come forward are going to be the ones that are augmenting the existing organ. So let's say, let's take kidney, chronic kidney disease, for example. Um, this is a space I worked in also before I was here. So let's say you're a stage three or four 
chronic kidney disease and your doctor is starting to talk to you about dialysis um, and having to go on dialysis to survive, there are some therapies that are emerging now that would enable you to restore enough of your kidney function that you could delay that dialysis by six or 12 months. So those are the kind of things that are, are going, those are in the trial stage, not the widely marketed stage. And so those are the kind of things that are gonna come forward now, you know, uh, sooner. The things that would be like, you have to have your whole liver removed and you need an entire new liver to plug in there. I think that's quite a ways away. That's a tall order. So those are kind of the two bookends of, you know, there are things that are already in clinical trials that are headed our way now. And then there's the, you know, you're, you need to replace an entire organ, an entire heart, an entire liver, an entire lung. Um, people are working on that, but I still think it's, it's quite a ways away. And as a, my previous company before here was actually trying to develop something for that space. And in the end, what slowed us down was not the science. It was the ability to access the raw materials and make the finances work. So if you could make the thing and you could get reimbursed, you know, by X number of dollars, could, could, you, could that be enough money for you to have made, made the organ? And it was not. So there's a lot that goes into that decision uh, financially and technical feasibility and everything else. But. Okay, a couple more questions. <laughs> One would be, if during screening, if a uh, genetic disorder is identified, is the patient notified? Mm, so if the, in, if the screening is done in the hospital, as part of the birthing process, then absolutely that happens. Um, and then the, whether or not the patient in the consent form that they are given, they specifically speak to that, um, whether they want results along those lines or not. So the testing that is done of the mother, she is informed of those results. Um, the type of consent that is signed dictates whether if you do testing on the cells like way down the road, whether or not there's any obligation to report that back. And most people don't uh, do that, have that reported back. Does that okay. answer your question? Yep. Okay. The other one uh, I have, well, there's actually two more. How do you approach couples about donating the placenta? Is it through the OBGYN, hospital, or prenatal classes? Okay, so there's an awareness um, through the, the OBGYN offices and through the hospital, and, and I don't know the answer to the classes thing. I'll, I'll ask and find out for you because I just don't know the answer. So there's an awareness that you can donate. And then uh, at the hospital that our partner works with, they have a relationship with the birthing staff over there and they have permission to, for a couple that is going to discard their uh, birth tissue after the baby is born, they have permission to go in and ask that couple, if you're going to discard this, would you be willing to donate it instead? And that's how that happens with an actual dialogue uh, between their coordinators. Okay. Uh, the, 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 I'm gonna try to combine these. There, there has to do with Crohn's disease and one has, uh, I have a granddaughter who suffers from Crohn's disease. How to get in touch with your organization to see if she qualifies for treatment. And the other one was, how can a person with Crohn's disease get more information on these trials or treatments? Okay, so I, uh, I will take an action line. So we're not running the trial, right? So those are all right. being done at different medical universities. But what I can do, um, and Mike, maybe what I can do is send this to you and then you can distribute it to the people who wanted to know. Okay. Um, or you can send me an, uh, the info at amnionfoundation.org. You can always welcome to send me an email. That, I think I that do, might be a good way to go for the okay. folks that have sent those questions in. That's a very easy process. Okay, that's great. Okay. But I, what I can do is provide you um, a list of the places where those trials are being conducted 
that particular one that we looked at today, the trial was completed. And I don't know, I will have to go look and see where they are at in the next stage, if they're at phase three now, um, and where those trials are getting run. So a lot of them are being run in multiple centers all over the world. And so those give you more options of places you may be able to access to, to get it. And that's one, you know, if, if I had that disorder, I would be very interested in, in trying this, even in the clinical trial stage. So I can give you, a, I put together a list of the places where this is happening. Um, and then there's usually a, um, through clintrials.gov, the website, there is a place where you can see the contact information um, for, for those trials. So I, I will put together as much information as I can get. Okay. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Presno. That, it's incredible the potential for these cells and all these different therapies. And uh, it's so exciting to know that this is being done right here in our own backyard. So I'm going to turn it back over to Randy. Okay. Dr. Presno, you're on your you work every day in the cutting edge of science. And it's just totally awesome the impact that you and your foundation will have on humanity. We thank you so much for the work that you do. And we thank you for your wonderful, informative presentation. As a matter of fact, a contribution will be made to the Rotary Foundation in your name in appreciation for you being with us today. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much for this presentation. And for those of you participating in this webinar, we appreciate you being with us today. And if there is nothing else for the benefit of Rotary, we will stand adjourned. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Dr. Presno. Thank you so much. Have a great